21. stoljeće donijelo je mnoga paradigmatska znanstvena otkrića u rasponu od neuroplastičnosti mozga do epigenetike, koja postupno mijenjaju ideju o genetičkoj determiniranosti čovjeka. No svako proljeće prvo najavljuju usavljene laste. Prije 15. godina jednom takvom lastom moglo se zvati biologa Brusa Liptona, koji se bavio epigenetikom i prije nego što je ona dobila ime u svojoj knjizi Biologija vjerovanja. Mehanizmi našeg biološkog sustava, pokazalo se, zapravo su komunikacijski kanali između naših mentalnih stanja, posvjesnih uvjerenja i stanja našeg tijela. Zato ćemo Brusa Liptona i biologiju vjerovanja, sve manje ali još uvijek, sresti ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobar večer. Dobar večer i vama, gospodin Lipton. Prije 15. godina objavili ste knjigu, ili prije zapravo desetak godina, nešto između toga, 2006. biologija vjerovanja, koja je u stvari bila najava cijelog pogleda jednog drugačijeg na svijet. Pa koja bi bila, prije nego što uđemo u detalje, osnovna ideja te biologije vjerovanja? The main idea is to recognize that we are very powerful in controlling the character of our life. Okay? We have been programmed to believe we are victims of life, when in truth we are creators of our life. And there's an old saying, knowledge is power. But another way to say the same thing is, a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And we have uh, not understood who we really are. And a new biology reveals that we are powerful in creating our biology on the inside and our life experiences on the outside. So there's new knowledge that is different than the conventional education that people receive. Pogledajmo za početak staru sliku kakva je bila prije svih ovih istraživanja na početku 21. stoljeća. Na koji način je darvinistički pogled na svijet oblikovao našu percepciju stvarnosti? Što nam je on govorio? From conventional education, we are programmed that uh, the genes control the character and behavior of our life. Uh, since, as far as we know, we did not pick the genes, and you can't change the genes, and we're told the genes turn on and off by themselves, uh, then that means we really, our life, uh, we are a victim of our heredity. If you've got cancer running in your family, you expect you will get the cancer. If you've got cardiovascular disease in your family, you will expect you'll have a heart attack. Uh, so we give up our power and say the genes control who we are. Uh, and the new biology is completely different. It says how our consciousness is actually controlling our genetics on the inside and our life experiences on the outside. A very important point is the most valid science on planet Earth is called quantum physics. The most tested, the most verified of all science, quantum physics. The number one principle of quantum physics is consciousness is creating your life experience. The new biology that I write about says the same thing as quantum physics. Consciousness is creating our life experiences, but then in the biology of belief I show the mechanism of how consciousness uh, controls our genetic activity and our behavior. And when we understand that, then we are powerful. We are more powerful than genes. We are the creator of our life. Što nas to stanice mogu naučiti o nama, zbog čega ste usporedili stanice sa malim ljudima i na koji način zapravo uh, stanice i uče? In evolution, we didn't start with people and animals. We started with just single cells. And the single cells, like amoeba, uh, were the only form of life. But as they started to live, they learned how to live in harmony with the environment. When the environment changes, the cells change their biology to match the environment. Then the cells started to learn to come together in a community to share their wisdom, to come together and share their wisdom. So everything we see as animals or plants are actually communities of cells working together in harmony. So a human, uh, we see ourselves as a single one individual, but the truth is under our skin is 50 trillion cells and the cells work together in harmony to give us this life experience. More important, 
there's not a new function in the human body that's not already present in most of the single cells. A single cell has a digestive, respiratory system, musculoskeletal system, endocrine system, nervous system, reproductive system. Even single cells have immune system. So I say, so a human is a community of 50 trillion cells, and our behavior is the same behavior as the individual cells, but in a large community. So we have 50 trillion cells sharing awareness and sharing harmony. When, so when you're in health, the community is working together uh, supporting your life. But when you're in disease, you're actually breaking the community up and there's har no harmony, disharmony is going on. That's what disease is all about. So the important insight is if you want to understand how a human works, you don't have to study the human. You could study just a single cell because the same behavior is in a cell is the same behavior as in the human, and it's easier to study the cell to see how that works. And my research has always been studying the individual cells and learning how they create life and how they respond to life. And I learned so much that I changed my life by living in the rules that I learned from the cells. And that's what uh, has changed everything about my life. Uh, I'm so much healthier and happier. When I understood how cells do it, I could do it too. Puno prije uh, Darwin ili možda nekako u slično vrijeme uh, zagonetom života bavio se i biolog Lamarck kojeg su kasnije i odbacili u novije vrijeme pomalo opet i potvrdili. Uh, pogotovo je, bi bilo zanimljivo čuti kakve on imao vizije i u kojoj mjeri su one bile sukladne sa najnovijim otkrićima. When science tried to understand how life works, we, we first look at the nature of evolution, because this is what causes change from the animals. And so if we understand evolution, then we could understand how cells work. Well, people think Charles Darwin was the first theory of evolution. This is not true. Uh, it's 50 years before Darwin, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, the French biologist, was the first scientist to write a theory of evolution. So the theory of evolution did not come from Darwin. The theory of evolution came from Lamarck. But Lamarck had a problem because he was able to create the science when Napoleon beat the aristocrats and the king. And that's when the average people, and Lamarck was like, he was uh, upper class, but a very poor upper class. And Napoleon raised him to the top of the royal society in France. And in that position, that's when Lamarck wrote about the evolution. But when Napoleon lost, then the church and the aristocrats came back and they wanted to squash Lamarck. And, and uh, so they made fun of Lamarck and uh, they distorted what his theory was. Uh, and then 50 years later, Darwin comes up with a theory. And in fact, even Darwin did not come up with a theory. It was another gentleman by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace. He was the original uh, writer of the theory that Darwin then put his name on it. Because Alfred Russell Wallace sent Darwin a final paper, a manuscript, and said, here's a theory of evolution. If you think this is good, would you give it to the Royal Society? And Darwin had an emotional breakdown because Darwin was going to be the upper class noble person who was going to provide a theory. And Alfred Russell Wallace was commoner. And, and in England, the upper class and the lower class, uh, they, they don't mix. And so the idea of a theory from someone from the lower class didn't go well. So Darwin's name went first because he was upper class. But it really comes from Alfred Russell Wallace, the theory. Uh, and it's a theory based on two steps. First, there's an alteration of heredity, a mutation that changes the offspring. So like when two dogs mate, they make a litter of puppies. And sometimes one of the puppies, uh, they call it the runt of the litter, the, the weak one is different than all the rest. It has diff something changed. It's a different genetics. And the idea was, what if you take a runt and mate it with another runt? Then you get a weak, you get a whole different line of animals. So this was the idea. First, in evolution, is a change in heredity, and then the second part is competition. 
meaning did this change make you more powerful or did the change in your genetics make you weaker? If it made you more powerful, then those genes will be passed on to a future generation. But if the genes made you weaker, then the animals would die out and the gene would not go anywhere. So two steps. First, random mutation. Second step, what's called natural selection, competition for power. We built our civilization on this belief that life is a struggle. That's the, they, they used to shorten Darwin's theory and say, uh, life is a struggle, a competition for fitness with survival of the fittest. And uh, that has become part of our culture. So everyone thinks, okay, we go out in the day and we struggle and we fight, and if we win, that was the destination. This is unfortunately not just wrong, but it is one of the biggest problems in the world because it supports aggression, it supports war. It says war, yeah, one side fights the other. Who's more powerful, the winner? Uh, and this is completely wrong. Uh, if we understand we came from, the, like in a biblical sense, we came from a garden, okay? Uh, and today we're destroying the garden. This is a big problem for humans right now. Uh, but if you go back and you say, is the garden a battleground of competition? I say, no, a garden is cooperation. And this is what science in the recent last few years has recognized. Evolution is not based on competition. It's based on cooperation. And this is what the world has to learn right now. And interestingly, Lamarck's theory is the more accurate theory today than is Darwinian theory. Because Lamarck said, it's based on the harmony of nature and organisms live in harmony with each other, that the organisms fit the environment. A polar bear is not in Africa, it's in the Antarctica or Arctic. Uh, 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 an orchid is not in the Arctic, it's down here. So every organism fits an environment. And this is what we have to learn. We have to learn how to become more uh, fitting in the environment, not destroying the environment, because we have some belief that we control nature. We, we are dominant. It's like, no, we are part of nature. And we must learn to live in harmony with nature. We have to recognize every one of us is like a cell in the body of something bigger called humanity. That's what we're trying to evolve. And so right now, just like in our health issues, one of the biggest health issues is our own cells are fighting ourselves. That's called autoimmune disease. And that's when your cells are having a war on the inside. And we are the cells having a war on the outside. And to bring peace, they have to bring harmony of all people together to recognize we are all part of one organism and not separate. The separation is causing the problem. Na koji način ste pokazali u knjizi da biologijom ne upravljaju geni i također što upućuje na to da se geni ne prenose samo reprodukcijom potomstvu nego da se geni šire i između vrsta? The conventional story is genes control the character of our life. And that's also we are told that genes turn on and genes turn off and regulate our biology. This is completely false understanding. Genes do not control themselves. Genes are blueprints. That's exactly what they are to make what are called proteins. Proteins are the building blocks to make a human body. They're the, the molecular building blocks. Uh, it's like a, a giant, what they say, Lego set uh, with 100,000 different proteins. We can assemble them and, and make different things, okay? So I said, but proteins are complex. Where do they come from? I said, genes are the blueprints to make a protein. I go, so? I say, a blueprint doesn't have on and off. There's no such thing as a blueprint activating itself. And I say, well, this is the problem because we're told genes turn on and off, but they don't. Genes are controlled by the environment. So it all of a sudden it says, then what environment you're in is going to influence your genes. And my research 52 years ago was I put cells, genetically identical cells, in three different petri dishes. So all the dishes have genetically the same cells. But I changed what is called the culture medium. 
in laboratory, culture medium is like blood. So if I grow human cells, I create in a laboratory uh, culture medium, I make, I make the equivalent of blood. And I put it in the culture dish, and the cells live in that. But since I make a culture medium in a lab, I can make different versions. I could add or take things out different. So I make three different versions of culture medium, slightly changing the chemistry. But in three dishes, I have genetically identical cells in all the dishes. But in environment A, culture medium A, the cells form muscle. In the second Petri dish, with a different culture medium chemistry, environment B, the cells form bone. In the third Petri dish, again, different culture medium chemistry, environment C, the cells form fat cells. So I said, well, what controlled the fate of the cells? Bone, muscle, fat, what controlled that? The genes didn't control that. It was the culture medium, the environment that the cells were in. So I go, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, how does that relate to me? I say, because we are skin-covered Petri dishes. Underneath your skin, 50 trillion cells. And you have the original culture medium. Blood is the original one. And I said, well, in the research, the culture medium controls the genes. And I go, it doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish or the cell is in a skin dish. It's the culture medium that controls the genes. OK, so I say, blood is controlling genes. I say, yeah, but the chemistry of the blood. Then the next important question is then, what controls the chemistry of the blood? The brain is the chemist. And then the most important question, well, what chemicals should the brain put into the blood? And I go, whatever the picture in the mind is, the brain translates the picture into chemistry. So for example, if you have a picture of love in your mind, the brain releases some very wonderful chemicals into the blood, such as dopamine, which gives you pleasure. That's why love is pleasure. Uh, oxytocin, which is bonding you to the one you love, OK? Uh, and, and something called growth hormone. Growth hormone does exactly what the name is. It gives you growth. So I say, when you're in love, you have pleasure, you are bonding, and you become healthy. And that's why when people fall in love, other people say, see how they glow, see how healthy they are. That's the chemistry of love. But if you have a picture of fear or stress in your mind, you don't release the chemistry of love into the blood. You release stress chemistry into the blood, chemicals that affect the, uh, the immune system and the health of the body. It's different chemistry. Different picture, different chemistry. And so the chemistry of stress actually uh, can shut down your body and cause you to be sick. And in fact, 90% of today's illness is directly due to the chemistry of stress, not to the genes. Uh, and so basically it says this, genes do not control themselves. That is a fact. Genes are controlled by the environment. And then here comes the most important part. Between the environment and our cells is the mind. It's in between. So the cells don't see the real environment. The cells see only what the mind sees. So two people could be standing in the same place, one going, ah, that's a scary world. And the other one right next to him going, it's a beautiful world. I say, the cells in each one have different information. The one who is afraid has stress chemicals in the blood. The one who sees the world as beautiful has healthy love chemicals in the blood. So the point is this. It's the chemistry of the blood that determines the genetics and the behavior. So we have been blaming disease on genes when maybe less than 1% of disease is connected to genes. At least 10% or less, maybe 1% of disease is connected to genes. The rest, lifestyle, perception, belief, how you respond to the world, how the mind interprets the world is controlling your genes. And I say, why is that important? And the answer is this. If genes controlled you, you're a victim. You, don't, you didn't pick the genes. You can't change them. And they're supposed to turn on and off you, by themselves. You're a victim. But the new science says, no, wait, you control the genes. How you see the world, what stress you're under, how you perceive the world, you change your genetics. So old story, you're a victim. The new story, epigenetics, you're a master. 
Now, the important part about this is DNA is the blueprints of life. And what's interesting is this, that we grew up in a natural environment and lived in harmony. All organisms in a garden are living in harmony. But once we start to change the genes of organism, genetic modification, GMO, food, all of a sudden we're playing with the genes, with the blueprints. And it turns out that organisms can pick up the genes and give it to another organism. So uh, at first they put special genes in plants. But then they found when the plant died and the bacteria were eating up the dead plant, the bacteria picked up the genes. Then it turned out the bacteria genes could be passed to other bacteria. And, and all of a sudden we start to see the genes are being connected to everything. So if we eat genetically modified food, the bacteria in our gut, which we need for survival, when they digest the food, they pick up these genes too. So then our own bacteria that we need can be genetically modified just by the food that we eat. And all of a sudden it says, now you're, you're messing with, with the machinery. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem because we don't have enough knowledge. And uh, when you don't have enough knowledge, when you make a change, you could, you could destroy things. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, the idea of genetically modified food uh, is a disaster. It's because they don't recognize that, yeah, I eat the food, but now the bacteria picked up the food. Then we find out the bacteria can send the genes into our own body, so we become modified. We don't have enough science and understanding to do this genetically modified food at this time. And this is creating a problem in the environment. Uh, as I said, they make special plants that, that you could spray poison on and, and kill everything else, but the plant is resistant. Guess what? The plants on the outside around the garden have now picked up those genes, too. And now, guess what? They're called super weeds. Why? They can't be killed by the weed killer anymore because their new, the genes they picked up from the bacteria from the modified plants protect them. It's like, we, we, you don't control, just say I put the modified genes here, they go everywhere. And so it's like, we're, we're taking some knowledge, not enough knowledge, but some knowledge, and with that little knowledge we are making a very dangerous situation for all of us. Kada već pričamo o mehanizmima kako informacije ulaze u stanice, ključno je ustanoviti da mozak stanice nije jezgra, nego stanična membrana. I zanimljivo je što ta stanična membrana ne reagira samo na kemikalije, kao što je nekako bilo dominantno razmišljati 50, 60, 70 godina, nego na svako jaka radijacijska elektromagnetna polja. Objasnite nam na koji način je membrana zapravo mozak stanice i koje sve informacije i kakve sve vrste receptora ona ima da ih može uhvatiti. For the longest time they said the nucleus of the cell is the brain of the cell because the genes are in there. And the belief was genes turn on and off like neurons, on, off, on, off. But this isn't true. The genes are programs. It's the membrane, the skin of the cell, that is the interface between the outside and the inside. So the membrane is reading what's going on outside and adjusting what's going on inside the cell. Uh, and, and it's interesting because a cell, a, a human is like a, a very large cell. Our skin uh, is the interface like the membrane. And in human embryology, the skin is what gives rise to the brain and the nervous system. So like the cell, our brain and nervous system is coming from the skin. And like the cell, the cell has receptors to see the world. Well, we have receptors built into the skin, eyes, Ears, nose, taste, touch, temperature, pain. These are receptors built into the skin, how we read the environment. Cells have molecular receptors that read signals from the environment. Now, originally, because of the belief of a material and an energy realm in the universe, that the universe has two different realms, and the body is made out of matter, so it was believed that the body could only respond to signals made out of matter, chemicals, drugs. But this belief system changed in 1929, when quantum physics said, matter, physical matter is an illusion. We're all energy. It's an illusion. You see me because of light. But underneath the, the photons of light that are bouncing back, you see a reflection of light. Underneath, 
It's energy under here. There's nothing physical you can see. So it also turns out then the receptors that are reading the environment, they don't respond just to physical things that we see as physical. They respond to the entire energy spectrum, the whole vibrations of everything around us, because every atom is, is a vibration. Uh, it's not uh, physical molecules like we saw in our mind and in the book. That's wrong. It's all energy. That's what quantum physics is different than Newtonian physics. And I said, but what's relevant? Well, energy is connected to everything. So we are connected to each other. We're connected to the environment, everything around us. And cells have to read everything. So the receptors on the surface of the cell, like eyes and ears for a cell, they read the energy environment. And energy is more effective as a signal than our chemicals. So I can say, I can send you an energy signal to heal you, or I can give you a chemical signal to heal you. Uh, and a famous uh, uh, physicist at the University of London, McClare, said, do the cells prefer energy signals or do the cells prefer chemical signals? And it turns out the cells prefer energy signals. Energy is a hundred times more efficient to send information than is a chemical. So basically it says our belief system about the physical world and the drugs and the chemistry is not in modern science. Modern science says it's all energy. And energy is life. Uh, and this becomes an important part because we are energy beings responding to energy fields. And so thought is an energy field. And this is how I thought can control us more powerful than chemicals can you know, control us. So we have to start recognizing our belief that we have grown up with, that there's a physical world and an energy world. Th this is not true. It's all energy. And that energy is the most important way of signaling the cells than our drugs and chemistry. In fact, before medical school, before drug companies. People healed each other where they say hands-on healing. They would put energy into people and through that energy heal people. That was the only way that people used to get healed and still one of the best ways of healing is through energy, not through the chemistry. Because chemistry is a secondary form of information. Energy is primary form of communication in biology. And the cell membrane, the skin, is designed with what are called receptors, like eyes and ears for a cell, to read the energy. And so you have feelings. The feelings are an energy that, like, do you feel good? Do you feel bad? I go, that's an energy that's inside. Objasnite nam vezu između proteina i elektromagnetizma. Na koji način uh, zapravo su oblici uh, i elektromagnetska polja ona koja diktiraju načine kako će se proteini povezati, a uh, ne neki drugi fizički faktori kako se mislilo? The body is made out of building blocks called proteins. Those are the molecules that give us our anatomy. Okay, so when you look in the mirror, you're looking at uh, a machine made out of protein. But Protein is, when it's created, is like a string, like a piece of yarn for knitting, okay? But there are electrical charges, positive and negative, positive and negative. So when the string is created, it will fold itself up into a structure. And that's the three-dimensional appearance of a protein. Starts out as a string, but like self-knitting, it will adjust itself and make a three-dimensional structure. I say, yeah, but what determined the three-dimensional structure, electrical charges. So I say, well, what happens if a protein with a three-dimensional structure receives an energy signal that, uh, like a lock and key, binds to the protein, the energy? Well, it changes the protein's shape. It re-knits into a different shape. That's movement. That's where life comes from. Life comes from proteins changing shape in response to environmental signals, okay? And I say, okay, so signal plus protein equals behavior. I say, well, when a person dies, they still have the proteins, but they have no life. I say, well, what's missing? Well, the proteins are still there. The signals stop. When the signals stop going to the cells, the proteins don't move. And then that's when you are dead. The proteins don't move, no more life. So what causes protein movement? 
The structure of the protein responds to environmental signals, primarily energy signals. And when the energy binds to the protein, it causes the protein to re-knit, change the shape. And the movement from that is where life comes from. So proteins not just provide for anatomy. Proteins provide for what we say physiology, action, movement, and life. But not proteins alone. Proteins plus environmental signals. So uh, this is where life comes from, the movement of the proteins. And that's because the protein changes shape when it responds to energy signals. Sada možemo popričati o učinku placebo o kojem smo razgovarali u ovoj istoj emisiji sa Joem Dispensom koji je na kraju svoju knjigu nazvao Placebo ste vi. E, poznat je prič, e, primjer jednog britanskog liječnika iz 1952. koji je nehotice hipnotičkom seansom željeći izlječiti bradavice, zapravo na jednom djetetu izlječio e, puno težu bolest, kasnije to više nije uspio ponoviti, no to je pokazalo koliko su naša podsvjesna uvjerenja zapravo naš vodič. E, naravno, ako pričamo o mnogobrojnim pojavama hodanje po vatri, takozvanim parapsihološkim fenomenima, uvijek e, e, se pokazuje još jedan faktor X. Pa na koji način zapravo je taj efekt o kojem mi pričate prepoznat kao placebo, nažalost možda i nedovoljno korišten do danas, ali koji govori upravo o tome kako naša uvjerenja prije svega stvare u stvarnost. What we have to understand is that uh, the genes and the behavior of the cell are controlled by the signals from the environment in the blood. That's where the cells are information is coming from. Like in a culture dish, I change the culture medium, I change the fate of the cells. In my body, the culture medium is the original blood, the chemistry of the blood adjusts the genetics and the behavior. So then I say, yeah, but that's controlled by your thought. If you have positive thought, then you are giving information to the cells. Life is good, life is wonderful, take care of yourself. But if you give negative thought, which people don't, you know, we say placebo. Yeah, placebo is positive thinking. The, this pill is going to heal, heal me. I believe this is going to heal me, that's positive. I take the pill, I get healed, it's a sugar pill. The sugar didn't heal me, it was my belief that healed me. And people say, yes, that's a placebo effect. Positive thinking is what healed you, not the pill. And then I say, well, that's true. Positive thinking can give us very strong powers. But what people don't understand is negative thinking is equally powerful, but in the opposite direction. Positive thinking can heal me. Negative thinking can cause any disease. It even can cause death. If you believe you're going to die, just because you believe it strong enough, you can die just from the belief. So the idea, it's the power of belief. Positive belief goes toward health. Negative belief goes toward disease. And then I say, well, how powerful am I? I say, well, what's your belief? You feel that you are weak? Then you are open to, uh, to uh, attack. And, and so ancient history, they used to say, surround yourself with white light. They would say that like protection. Well, there is a, a light around us. Uh, the Russians have been dealing with it called Kirlian photography, where they can photograph and they can show the energy outside of the body, going around the body. When you're in health, the energy is a, a whole field of light. But when you start to get sick, there are what are called holes, perforation, holes in that light. And when there are holes in that light, things from the outside can come in and bother you. So. If you want to walk across the hot coals, you have to have a very positive thought. And that very positive thought makes the white light. You can walk across the heat, though the heat won't go through the light, okay? But if you, in the middle of the walk, go, can I do this? You question at that moment, poof, the white light is gone, you burn yourself instantly. So the idea is this. We are powerful creators, but we create with positive belief, we create health and happiness. With negative belief, we can create any disease and we can even die. And so the idea is a belief is an energy field. And the energy field is picked up by the receptors of the cells. And positive belief gives strength to the cells. Negative belief takes away the strength from the cells. So uh, even, interesting point, uh, in the United States and the South, There are religious people who, uh, who create religious ecstasy. Uh, and they call snake handlers. And they, they handle poisonous vipers. To, even if they get bitten by the snake, they don't have a problem. But some of them, they call it in English, testify. 
meaning I do something to trust God. I believe in God will save and protect me. I trust God. They drink strychnine poison. Strychnine poison. They drink it. No problem. And what's the point? The power of belief is what saves them. Belief is creating your life. Belief is the energy that precedes you. The energy before you even walk down the street, your belief is in front of you. And this creates whatever is coming into your life. We have to own this because we think we're just accidents. We're not accidents. We are creators of our life. And again, that's what quantum physics said in 1929. It's still true. Our consciousness is creating positive consciousness, create health. Negative consciousness creates disease, or you're open to anything negative. Positive, you are protected in your life. Važno je razumjeti da naše stanice imaju dva mehanizma, podržavaju rast i zaštitu, ali ne mogu djelovati u isto vrijeme. Objasnite nam taj mehanizam koji je zapravo esencijalni dio toga, možemo li uopće placebo koristiti u vlastitom životu? In a laboratory experiment, I put cells in a petri dish. In one dish, I put nutrients in front for growth. In the other dish, I put toxins. In the dish with the nutrients, the cells go to the nutrients, positive growth. In the dish with the toxins, the cells move away from the toxins for protection. Growth, you move to the signal, arms open, take it in. I, I call it assimilate, I take it in. Positive, I have to go to it, I have to take it in. Protection, I go away from it, and I close myself down. Protection is closed, okay? You, you can't be open and closed at the same time. You can't move to the stimulus and away from the stimulus at the same time. So you're either in growth <laughs> or you're in protection, but you cannot be in both at the same time. They're opposite behaviors to each other. So then we have to look at, well, where is your life? Are you living in fear? Oh, then you're shutting yourself down, protection. If you're living in love, you open yourself up to the world and you can grow. So it becomes important, are we going to grow or are we going to be in protection? I say, you can't stay in protection too long, you will die. Because protection is close yourself off. So uh, in the United States, when we thought the Russians were going to bomb us, we have a, uh, a bomb shelter. I say, okay, so they do a test. The siren goes off. Uh, everybody's working, growth, they're all working. Siren goes off, they go into a bomb shelter, no more work, protection. Where they're underneath the protection, okay? But then all clear, they say all clear, siren comes, we all go out and we go back to work again. But what would happen if the siren says, warning, we all go into the, to the bomb shelter and there's no all clear? How long can you live in a bomb shelter? You run out of food, water, whatever, you're going to be dead. You have to get out and grow again. When we are in too much protection, we are closed down. And when we're closed down, we stop growth. And you need to have growth to stay alive. You need to take in food, water, oxygen. You have to be open. And in protection, it's closed down. So it's very important to recognize that. You use protection when necessary, but you can't stay in protection. Protection, you will die. And so we have to stop being afraid. Fear is what causes us to go into protection. And fear, but we read the newspaper, we watch the news, uh, we get f afraid. And the more afraid we are, the more we wall ourselves off. And guess what? The more fear, the more sickness we have on the planet. Više puta ste spomenuli pozitivno razmišljanje, ali u stvari pozitivno razmišljanje nije ključ samo po sebi. U jednom od vaših intervjua ste rekli da naša posvijest divovski kazetofon koji samo snima i reproducira. Znači pričamo o uvjerenjima koje, koja, koja, kojih nismo svjesni i na, koja na neki način moramo promijeniti, a to baš nije lako ih nismo svjesni. Na koji način se od pozitivnog razmišljanja i što treba napraviti da se doista promijeni uh, temeljno neko uvjerenje koje možda ne prepoznajemo? Because positive thinking is creative thinking. I'm thinking of a future. I'm creating a future health. That, so that's creative, okay? Mm -hmm. Conscious mind is creative. Subconscious mind is habit, just program. No creativity, really, just habit. And I say, well, if I stay in my conscious mind, I can create my life. 
uh, it, the way I want it. That's called the honeymoon. That's what happens when we fall in love. We, we stop playing the program from subconscious. But for everyday life, only 5% of your life is coming from the conscious creative mind. 95% is from the program, from the math. You just do the math. How much of my life is coming from positive thinking? 5%. And how much from the other? 95%. So you can have positive thoughts, but they're not running your life. It's only a small piece. And so this is why there's trouble with positive thinking. People say, I tried positive thinking. It doesn't work. I go, yeah, but you're only thinking positive 5% of the time. That's not enough. Positive thinking, when it works, when you fall in love with somebody. Your life could be blah, 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 blah. Then you meet somebody. You fall in love. 24 hours later, life is heaven on earth. You had blah, 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 and then 24 hours, heaven. what happened that was different? Science now knows when you fall in love like that, you stop playing the subconscious program. You stay what is called mindful. You keep your conscious mind present. And I say, well, if conscious mind's creative and you keep it present, then that's how you created heaven on earth. And I say, when the honeymoon goes away later, why? Because at some point, the program takes over. And then all of a sudden, these negative behaviors, you didn't play them when you first fall in love because you stopped playing programs. You started being creative. And that's where honeymoon comes from, or health, or happiness from being creative. But when you start thinking, then all of a sudden, the subconscious takes over autopilot. And then the creativity is ended. Positive thinking doesn't work anymore. The love doesn't work when that, that's negative stuff coming from subconscious. So the idea is simply this. Positive thinking works if you stay mindful. Uh, but if you start thinking, that's when you let go of the control and the subconscious is autopilot. And then you become whatever the program was. Negative programs, which most of us have, come from the subconscious. Uh, and honeymoon is not from subconscious. Honeymoon is from creative conscious mind. Uh, and that's a very unique experience when you stop playing the program and you start creating from what you wish and your desire, you manifest it. But when you start thinking, you are back into the habit subconscious program. And that depends on where you grew up and your family and your history. U knjizi ste napisali da um ima moć reprogramirati sve. Međutim, u našem svakodnevnom životu na neki način nas vode automatske navike i automatske reakcije o kojima uopće ne razmišljamo. Na koji način se onda treba taj um disciplinirati da doista može reprogramirati nas na tu tako obećavanu sreću koja proizlazi iz percepcije? The programming that we get that controls our life is from the first seven years. Okay? Because the brain is operating not at a higher vibration of consciousness, but at a lower vibration called theta. Theta is, um, for a child, imagination, okay? So uh, a child will uh, pour uh, uh, nothing into a teacup and then drink nothing and say the tea was wonderful. That's imagination, that's theta. But theta is hypnosis, okay? So for the first seven years, you get programs by not thinking or studying. You get programs just by watching, like a video recorder. I record what my mother said, I record what my father, my family, my culture. I record that, that's a program for first seven years. And that's uh, where we get the basic life program. Even the Jesuits said, give me a child for seven years, I will show you the man. They already knew the first seven years is the programming and after that, 95% of your life is coming from that program. So we get automatic programming because the brain is designed for automatic programming. Now you want to change the program. First of all, you need to know what is my program because I was being programmed even before I was born. I was being programmed in the womb. I say, well, what program did you get when you were zero? Okay, what program did you get when you were one? Two. I say, well, you don't know your program because you were not here when the mind wasn't working yet. So I need to first say, so I want you to know what your program is, simple. 95% of your life is coming from the program. Your life is a printout of your program. You're expressing whatever the program is, point. Whatever you like that comes into your life, things that you like and they come to you, they come to you because you have a program to let them come to you. But those things that you want, 
but you have to work hard and struggle, put a lot of effort in, I'm going to make it happen. Why are you working so hard? Because those things are not supported by your program. So the first thing, look at your life. Whatever you want, but you have to struggle, is because the program doesn't support that. That's why you are struggling. So you know what you want to change, the ones that you struggle. Relationship, health, good job, whatever. If you have trouble getting that, it's a program, OK? Now you want to change it. And I go, well, that's a problem. Because the conscious mind, which is the one connected to your spirituality, your creativity, that can learn in any different way. Read a book, watch a video, go to a lecture, boom, you can download it. Subconscious mind's habit. I go, what's important? It, a habit only works if it stays the same. If it changes, then it's not a habit anymore. And some of our habits are really important, like walking. When did you learn how to walk? Before you were two. Are you still walking? Yeah, because you've got a habit. <laughs> and you can be 100 years old, you're still walking. Habit. It doesn't change. So there's a problem. You want to change the habit mind? You have to do a different way of teaching the subconscious than teaching the conscious mind. So there are two natural ways that we learn subconscious and one new one. The first one is this. How did we learn the first seven years? The mind was in what is called theta, hypnosis. We were like a video recording. Just everything we saw was just going in and down into subconscious. Good things, bad things. It's all going in, OK? So first seven years, hypnosis. Uh, and that's because the mind is in theta. So important point, every night when you go to bed, the moment you fall asleep, the conscious mind shut off. The moment it shuts off, the brain is in theta for a period of time. So if you put earphones on with a program you want to be true, like a health program or a love program, whatever you want to be true, the, and you put them on as you go to bed. The moment the conscious mind goes to sleep, the brain is operating in the same way as a seven-year-old child. Whatever is coming in the ears is going straight into the subconscious. That's called self-hypnosis. You can put a program in as you go to bed. Okay. After age seven, you still learn programs, but you're, now you're conscious. You have a higher vibration. I said, well, how did you learn after age seven? Repetition, practice. You want to learn something? Practice. You want to play an instrument? you got to practice the instrument. You want to drive the car? You have to practice driving the car. Practice is repetition, just like exercise. Okay? You want to change your life? You have to make a new practice. You have to try, you know, live a different way. You have to say, I'm going to do this. And you have to tr just keep doing it. The more you do it, the more you practice an instrument, the better you are playing the instrument. The more you practice a new behavior, the more you practice it, the more that behavior becomes uh, part of your system. So the second way is repetition. If you want something different, then you have to behave differently. You have to practice every day. Okay? And there's now a third way. And this is amazing because it's called energy psychology. I go, what is that? I say, it's a way of what we call super learning, that you can open up the subconscious and download new information in 10 minutes. You, could ch you have a, a bad behavior 50 years. You can change it in 10 minutes using the new energy psychology. It's a way of engaging the subconscious mind to download very quickly something brand new, just like a child. Oh. The subcon How do you do this? Well, there's exercises. Uh, uh, here's what the difference is. Very quickly, you have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. They have different functions. Like the left hemisphere is intellectual. The right hemisphere is more emotional. Okay? When you're under seven, both hemispheres work together in harmony. That's how a child can download anything so fast. Both hemispheres are in harmony. After age seven, the brain separates. Sometime during the day, you're more intellectual. Later in the same day, you're more emotional. Then you're more, it's like a wave. One side, the other side, right side, left side. That's very difficult to learn. But if you can put both sides back together again, then you have an opportunity, like a seven year below seven, download real fast, boom, like this. So uh, one of the exercises is called a, a part of neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, okay? Mm -hmm. It's called brain gym. 
And this is an exercise. My right arm is controlled by my left hemisphere. My left arm controlled by my right hemisphere, OK? So this arm is controlled by this side. But when I cross the middle, it gets picked up by this side. So now both sides are watching this one. So if I cross both of my arms like this, and just sit here for a little bit, and cross your ankles, one leg over the other, so I'm crossing both, that gets both sides of the brain to start working together. And when they're in that together state, there's an opportunity now to put a new belief in. So as you're sitting in this state, uh, there's a little more to it than this, but if I'm sitting in this state and I have the belief statement, that's the most important part, what I want, and I wait a minute and then I start to repeat the belief statement. Uh, I am lovable. <laughs> it turns out, why? Because 80, 90% of the people will not test positive for the belief, I love myself. Most people will not love themselves because we've been criticized as children too much, OK? So I say, OK, I want to love myself. So I go, OK, I love myself. And, and then you say it. And if you don't love yourself, there'll be like what we call static. It won't be, it won't be peaceful. And you just sit there and you can say it again. I love myself. And then you wait and you say it again. Within about five minutes, 10 minutes, the belief will be into your subconscious. And, and you stand up, you walk away different. And that's uh, one of the ways of creating super learning. And they're about, uh, on my website, brucelipton.com, I have 25 or 30 different uh, modalities of energy psychology. You could pick one that you like. But these are modern, new technologies to help us change very quickly, because we must change quickly, because human behavior is causing the problems on the planet. We have to change our behavior. We have to get rid of the anger and the violence and the negative thinking. We have to become more positive and loving and open. And that means change the belief system. So three ways, self-hypnosis, earphones when you go to bed. Second, practice a new way every day, just practice. Uh, uh, let's say um, you're not happy, and every day you look around, it's not happy, it's not happy. And I go, OK, guess what? Every day, just say, I am happy to yourself. I am happy. I am happy. Just say it all day long, because it learns from repetition, practice. The more I say I'm happy, the more the subconscious finally will get it. And one day you'll wake up, and you guess what? You'll be happy without saying, I am happy, because it takes practice to put it in. OK? And then energy psychology, that's the modern new technology to help us make change within minutes. And this is necessary for us now, because human behavior is causing a problem on the planet, and we need to change behavior fast and now. Na kraju svoje knjige, napisane, kao što sam rekao, 2006. godine, spominjete fraktalnu geometriju. Zanimljivo je što kako desetljeća prolaze, kojim god smjerom čovjek krene istraživati svemir ili svijet, na neki čudan način uvijek dolazi do fraktalne geometrije. Nasim Harameniju našao u svemiru, Ingvin Sanđast u traumi, Piotr Gargajev u DNK, Potom imamo situaciju da su izračunali u početkom 20. stoljeća eto da postoje fraktali u oblacima, u valovima, u posvoda, na kraju krajeva fraktale već to što se naša stanica ponaša kao i mi sami. I rekli ste da vaša sigurnost, citiram, prozlazi iz proučavanja fraktalne geometrije. Pa na koji način fraktalna geometrija zapravo sažima i na neki način možda slikovito opisuje ovu priču u kojoj se na neki način sve opet ispripličuje u jednu cijelinu, kao što su stare tradicije govorile, sve je jedno, znači u svemu postoji duh ili mi smo danas rekli sve je kvantno polje. In understanding structure in space, the mathematics of structure in space is called geometry. Okay? The geometry that we learned in school is called Euclidean geometry from the Greek. Okay? I say, well, that's a geometry of the square, the triangle, the circle, the, the standard shapes that we know. I say, that geometry is good to make a building. Its geometry is good to make machines. But that geometry doesn't make nature. You can't use a Euclidean geometry and make a tree. You can't use Euclidean geometry and make a cloud. Uh, that geometry doesn't make nature. It turns out fractal geometry is the one that when you solve geometry using fractals, 
the images that you see are just like nature, trees and plants and clouds and mountains and all that. So I say the nature is not designed by Euclidean geometry, that's human design, buildings and machines, okay? But nature is designed using fractal geometry, different geometry. I go, so what's relevant? I go, fractal geometry is very simple. It uses one equation, and you put the numbers in the equation, and you solve it, you get an answer. And I say, then what? I say, take the answer, put it back into the equation, solve it again, you get another answer. Take the answer, put it back in the same equation, solve it again. You can repeat this a million times, okay? But here's the point. When you do the mapping of the geometry, when you put the numbers and you put it on a graph or something, when you do about a million of these, you start to see a structure come out. And the structure is the same as nature. Everything is nature. So the first point is this. Fractal geometry is the math that describes nature structure, okay? Fractal geometry uses the same equation over and over again. It's called in English iterated. Repeat the same equation. I'll give you a simple one, a very simple one. Take a line, cut it in half. Okay, that's the equation. So I cut it in half, what do I get? I get a half a line. I say, okay, take a half a line, put it back in the equation. What did I do? Take that line, cut it in half. Now I got a quarter of a line, okay? Take the quarter, put it back in the equation, cut it in half. Now I got an eighth of a line, okay? How many times can I do that? I could do it a million times. Every time it gets smaller, 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 but it's the same equation. Here's the beautiful part. Because the same equation is used over and over again, the images that come from that geometry repeat themselves over and over again at different levels, okay? The geometry of a human body is the same geometry of a cell. The, and why is it relevant? Because if I study a cell, it's the same structure as a human, as we mentioned before. There's no new function in the human, it's all the same as in the cell. Repetition of the image repeats itself. That's a character. I say, what's relevant? You don't have to study the whole system. You could just study one part. If you understand the pattern at one part, the pattern repeats itself over and over again. So why is cell biology so useful to understand a human biology? Because the pattern of the cell is the same pattern as the human. We have the same structures. But the cell is a different, a different level of the same structure, where uh, uh, amoeba puts out like called pseudopod arms. Okay, we have arms, okay? Uh, and so, if you understand fractal, it says you don't have to, to try to identify how everything works. Just study one part. And if you get the basic mechanism of one part, it's the basic mechanism by all of the parts. And so, fractal geometry is very instructive because you can learn about the whole by studying just a small part because the whole is a reflection of the small part over and over again. So fractals are the geometry that nature uses to create trees and clouds and mountains and water and the river and all that. It's all the same structure repeated over and over and over again. You look at a tree, it's got a trunk, it's got the limbs, and then it's got the branches. I say, you could look at the whole tree or you could cut this limb off, and if you look at just the limb, and the branches, it's like a tree already, okay? Or you take a branch and look at the branch. It's got the same structure with the, the whole tree. Every time you look at a smaller part, it's the same. So the relevance is with fractals, if nature is fractal, you don't have to study all of nature to understand how it works. You could just study a part of it because the pattern is repeated over and over again. It's sort of, they use the analogy, uh, the Russian Maestroshka dolls, where they have the wooden doll, and you open it up, inside is another wooden doll, almost like the same one. You open it up, inside is another one, just almost like the same one. You open it up, and every, you get smaller and smaller. But the smallest one has the same shape as the biggest one. So I don't have to study the biggest one, I could just study the smallest one, it gives me the same story. And that's an example of a fractal. The Matryoshka doll is a fractal. 
uh, of uh, all of them are the same images, just mm -hmm. smaller or bigger, depending on which way you're going. So, medicine, I don't study. A whole, I don't need to study a whole human body. Mm -hmm. I study one cell. That's a human body is based on the whole structure of one cell. U svakom slučaju vrlo korisno za znati. Zahvaljujem na ovom razgledu, gospodin Lipton, i za trudu i za neke sljedeće prilike. Doviđenja. Hvala. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.